So um, I just want to say thank you to everybody that joined us. Thank you to each one of our panelists. Um, the goal of this particular online conference or gathering, I don't know what we're calling these things, um, this webinar was simply right now with uh, the pandemic and COVID-19, what we're noticing is all of the restrictions on cannabis promotions um, went from, you know, crazy restrictive before to almost impossible now if you A, don't have money or B, don't have a publicist on retainers. So um, obviously we can't advertise like other industries um, and our main source of promotion and exposure over the last at least seven years that I've been in cannabis has been events. Obviously that's not happening now. So with our reduced options, we just wanted to bring together all of the most uh, recognized publicists and journalists within the industry, which I think we've done a pretty good job of grabbing um, most of the key publications and PR firms um, to discuss what the options are for brands now on a budget to really be able to grab some exposure and, and maybe just some helpful tips for earned media, email marketing, digital PR and marketing, um, and social media. So this is gonna just be more conversational. I'd like to go through and let each one of the panelists, um, I guess I should introduce myself as well. Let me back up. My name is Cynthia Salarzada. I'm the founder of Access Wire, the co-founder of Green Market Media, and I'm also the founder of um, House of Saka. So with my you know, extensive knowledge and experience within PR and marketing within this industry, I thought it would be a good idea for us to do, to do this at no cost to help all of the cannabis brands um, have some better insight on how they can garner some, some earned media and you know, do a little extra in their social media um, during these times. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Terry next and then why don't we just go through, well, I don't Cynthia, know how- Why don't we just introduce the people when they get to their section so that people like the okay. attendees can All that right. way. Like that. Otherwise, so thank you everyone for joining. I'm gonna hand it back over to Deborah and she's gonna take it from here. Great, thank you. Um, so as Cynthia mentioned that we really are viewing this more as a dialogue versus having a staid formal panel with three people or two people. We really wanted to bring everyone together. And as she noted, you know, you guys are the best and brightest. And we wanted to um, have this a little more casual and a little more uh, flexible. So that's why um, we've got so many people. Um, I'm kicking it off with really talking about the state of journalism today. And one of those, uh, what I'm gonna do is present some slides right now. Uh, that I put together. And so right now, um, the state of journalism is, it's, pretty, it's, it's been pretty rough. Um, what's kind of interesting though is with people home and working from home, they really are wanting a ton of content. So this is a new survey that just came out from Duke of Linden. 56% said they want to see and read more stories about business plans to recover from the pandemic. So that was super interesting. 62% um, of investors want more coverage on business recovery versus non-investors. So that, that kind of makes sense. You've got um, investors that really want to see, okay, well, how are companies going to come out of this? 46% um, are reading or watching more financial news than before the pandemic. So that's that's great for you know some of us like uh, Business Insider and MJ Biz Daily. So they really want to get uh, this business news. Only 26% said they're consuming less. So people are really glued to their screens right now. Hold on, Deborah. Can you put it on presentation mode so it looks a little bigger? There we go. Boom. So despite all the demand, uh, layoffs have increased. So that's what's been really crazy about this. While people are really wanting to read more content, we're seeing layoffs in journalism. Financial Times got 50,000 new subscribers, but they cut the staff hours, they cut the executive pay, contributor uh, budget was cut, the Economist laid off 90 people, all their top executives took pay cuts, courts re reduced their staff by 40% later. And this, folks, this has all happened within the last few weeks, all of these layoffs. Um, Vice Media, 5% of their workforce. 
I thought this was super interesting. The digital uh, news for Vice Media is 50% of their cost, but it only brings in 21% of their revenue. Cheddar closed their LA studio. Um, that included our, our uh, colleague, Chloe Aiello. She was let go. Uh, Vice also let go Alex Nocera. He was reporting on vape uh, trends. Basically, 36,000 jobs have been lost in journalism right now. Um, here's what's really happening. Big tech is destroying digital media. Google and Facebook carry our news content, but they don't pay us for it. Um, when people started to have started to complain, they've done a little bit. Uh, but here's what's kind of interesting that's happened just lately within the last couple of weeks as well. France's regulators are demanding Google pay publishers. So we're all crossing our fingers, that goes well. Australia's regulators are also negotiating uh, with for platform payments for publishers. So they're trying to save journalism as well. So big tech's response was, well, Facebook started paying some select big publishers directly, but that doesn't help us little guys. And Google started handing out grants for experimental journalism, but really that was described as a faux philanthropic handout. Um, now, Facebook and Google said, yeah, but we give you traffic. Isn't that great? Well, that doesn't really pay the bill. Um, here's another really um, unique situation here is the politicians are actually on the media side because they don't want to be the enemy of the media. So even though those lobbyists for Facebook and Google are really, really powerful, it's, it's great that the politicians are actually on our side. Um, so that's something that I take um, away from that is, look, demand is really high right now for news, but the news is strapped because the, the, as Cynthia said, the ad budgets have been cut and we can't do events. So it's really um, definitely hurting us. Um, and as she mentioned before, a lot of brands have had to scale back and so they've cut their PR teams or they cut their ad budgets, they've cut their marketing budgets, they've really pulled back. Um, I think really having said that, now I'm sure is the time to really get out there and promote your brand. And I'm going to turn it over right now to uh, Lewis Goldberg. He is a managing partner at KCSA Strategic Communications. Um, they do crisis communications, they do investor relations. Uh, Lewis has uh, been in the, the cannabis business for several years now. Um, Lewis, fill us in, what's going on um, from your point of view on the PR side? So we don't do a lot of brand specific communications when it comes to business to consumer. You know, we're focused on the business to business and business to investor communications. And the trends that you laid out, Deb, have been what's been going on in the media you know for the last 15 years it's not just that we've seen a uh, uh, shrinking of newsrooms over the you know the last you know 15 weeks or even 5 weeks I mean, they they just have accelerated dramatically um, but the the trends that you pointed out that there are people who are you know the average investor is consuming more financial news now means that for the Javier's of the world and the Jeremy's of the world, they are as important, if not more important than they've ever been um, because of who they are speaking to, which is the investor. The clients that we are working for um, who have either been forced to scale back their budgets or turn off are at an even greater disadvantage than they've ever been. You know, Bill Gates said, um, if I, it wasn't Bill Gates, I'm sorry, Steve Jobs said the last dollar I would ever spend is on public relations. Um, and that's because we are able to disintermediate um, the, the gatekeepers in communicating to target audiences. So working with you at Green Market Report um, and the report, you know, like Warren, who, who writes for Forbes, um, for Javier at Benzinga, um, there is an appetite amongst consumers and investors for good journalism. The stories are harder to place now. You really have to be able to understand what that intersection of cannabis, the capital markets and culture is and thread that needle because there is less room for the coverage of extraneous crap. You know, a new flavor 
of a new vape cartridge is not going to get covered. Um, stories that worked well early in the crisis were how the cannabis industry was adapting. Um, so there were lots of companies, <laughs> that is a very cute dog, John, um, cannabis companies who were using their extraction equipment to make hand sanitizer. That was a big story for five minutes. Cannabis companies who are adapting their employment policies. So you have to think not about cannabis as what we are using to deal with anxiety or stress or depression or PTSD, but where cannabis fits into the larger culture from a business perspective and tell those stories. And then respectfully to the journalists that are on with us, there are lots of other journalists that we need to be communicating to. So journalists who cover healthcare and mental health are just as important as journalists who cover stocks and bonds. You know, we need to be talking to journalists who cover employment trends, journalists who are covering bonds, journalists who are covering basically everything but weed. You know, these guys and these women who we have all worked with closely for years now as the industry has been built, you are as important as you've always been. But for the communicators who are working for these companies, we have to be thinking beyond that same limited set of reporters that we have pitched and developed relationships for years. I mean, that's, that's what I'm telling my clients. That's what I'm telling my team members. And that's what I'm doing. Fair enough. Hey, Gia, what about uh, your side? What are you seeing um, with your clients and what are you telling them? Oh, she's not. Hold on. You're on mute. I'm unmuted now. Yeah. And Gia Marone yeah. is with GVM yeah. Communications. She's also, if you don't know Gia, is uh, very well uh, involved in Women Grow. Yes. Okay. So thank you. CEO now, right? Yeah. President. Shonda's president. CEO and president. But thank you guys so much. First of all, I love this conversation. And um, to my fellow colleagues, hello. It's good to see you virtually. Uh, feels like it's been ages since I've seen many of the faces. Uh, I, I agree with everything that Lewis has said. Uh, and and what, I, what I found interesting during this time is uh, before going to advise clients on how to best promote their business, we immediately went into crisis communications mode, right? And we're still dealing with it slightly um, now, but we definitely hit, started off the pandemic um, with advising our clients on how to adjust and deal with this. They needed to communicate to, so our clients, we've got, um, we have a, a, a multi, uh, an operator in the state of Pennsylvania. And so for them, this was their first time really engaging in this kind of, of, of um, quote unquote, a crisis. And so we needed to guide them during this time on how to not only communicate internally, but also externally, but even within their community. Like just the whole point of what Lewis made in terms of how the industry itself had to adjust to what was happening. But now when I think about clients that have worked with even, let's say the um, NCR, so National Cannabis Roundtable, you know, they haven't changed their focus on what they're doing on the Hill. And that's been consistent, right? And so we've had to make sure that people stay focused, that the Safe Banking Act is still very necessary and we have to keep fighting for that. And we're continuing to educate the media um, through what has been the primary focus, which is COVID. Uh, what's interesting, I had a, a team call this morning and the feedback from my team is, hey, listen, everyone's ready to start shifting back to the news that they were covering before. And so it's a great opportunity for us as well as through our clients where we've been following up in terms of like op-ed pieces we've been asked um, for our clients to place, uh, which has been fantastic because we're using this time. And I think um, what Lewis was, the point Lewis made was so valid is that it's a great opportunity for us to, to further educate mainstream media. While I thoroughly appreciate uh, our colleagues on, on this uh, panel now uh, who that cover the industry. And I love our depth of knowledge, but now I'm taking advantage and our team is taking advantage of, hey, if these other colleagues of ours from mainstream are home, they're actually taking the time to talk to us where it's been harder while they were in their offices to reach them. Uh, 
Deborah, what, what I found profound is that the number of layoffs, as you said, uh, from those media outlets, many of those who were quite knowledgeable about cannabis and really understood what we were doing and, and understood the direction of which we were going. So what we've been doing from our end for those who are now having to pick up stories, what have you, is sort of revisiting those conversations we had maybe a year or two ago. Uh, but I'd say that, you know, thankfully we've been pretty fortunate. Our clients fully understand where we are. They understand that they have to pivot at any given moment. We are utilizing the media in terms of not just uh, providing, of course, quotes and background conversations, but we have been asked on a number of occasions if our clients can write op-ed pieces that are either relevant to what's happening or what they see um, could be happening next. I'd also I also appreciate the fact that with more companies that are shifting virtually, they're really looking for guest um, speakers to come on their podcasts or, um, uh, you know, like their virtual, you know, talk shows is what I kind of call them, which has opened, I think, or broadened the awareness, I think, of the general public on who these players are within the industry. And, you know, before it was a little bit more challenging to even get some of those opportunities because people have had to sort of pivot their um, approach to reaching to the general public. Like these online um, interviews have been great for us as well. We hadn't considered that before, but it's been quite, um, it's been quite positive. That's so uh, pretty interesting to hear. And I so with, uh, you know, say Cheddar, if you weren't in the New York area to be able to just go down to their studio and jump on a camera, then you were limited. Or if you didn't have a travel budget where you could be at some of these conferences. Uh, Rosie, Matteo, uh, why don't you tell us what you're experiencing and what you're telling your clients uh, with the situation that we're in right now? So, you know, obviously I agree with uh, what everyone else had just said, but there are two things that I would address. So one, you know, to the beginning of the, your slide in the state of the media industry, um, and even thinking about even Jeremy, for example, on this call, like people have been laid off, they've been furloughed. Jeremy was asked to pull off his cannabis speech and, and cover what was happening in New York. So really educating our clients to realize that their time is really limited. And we'd be super sensitive to the types of stories that we're telling because this is, and also everybody else is dealing with their own like mental things at home, right? So realizing that journalists are people and that we're pitching them, it has to be super relevant, right? Super relevant to what's happening right now, like within COVID and just sort of the bandwidth. So, so that's been, you know, one shift with the journalists who work up on a regular basis. But if you also think about it, this is the first time where cannabis has been deemed essential. So to Lewis's point, um, and Gia is that broadening our reach, we could do that now because this is one of the only industries where you know, everything's still ticking. There's so much opportunity that we can be reaching out to journalists across the nation in different regions about how essential it is and how, you know, they're helping humankind. So it's, it's been a really interesting um, couple of weeks um, and, and really actual watershed moment that, you know, cannabis is essential. So what does that really mean? What are the implications of that? Like, how will that move forward, you know, in the future? So that's what we're seeing. Thanks, Rosie. Yeah, it's, um, it's certainly been uh, pretty interesting on the uh, editorial side. And to your point, Lewis, yes, when I get a pitch about a new grapefruit flavored THC drink <laughs> or a CBD pillow, no, I'm not gonna cover that right now. Um, and it's, it's just, you know, it doesn't do you as a PR person any good to have, you know, the automatic delete when your name pops up. Um, you know, and I think that's a great segue to uh, something that John wanted to talk about, um, Hold on, which was a, saying a lot of do's and don'ts. Can I just jump in one thing about brands quickly? Of course. About coverage. So, but we do work with brands that their job is to launch new products and they had a lot of things that, are, that have been planned, right? Like things are still rolling within their businesses. So what do you do, right? So even Terry wrote about this about like how brand, how companies had to shift like their marketing, right? So there's, there's the story of how marketing has changed. So there are ways to pivot that. Um, and she wrote about just the different um, creative ways that brands are going about 
marketing. So like that was a story. So there's some interesting points to that as well. Well, and, and, just, and that is Deb, a really good point. Um, you know, I had a, a interview with a film producer, you know, last week because they had they were supposed to launch their film at South by Southwest about you know acid trips and psychedelics and stuff. And obviously, no South by Southwest, no movie premiere, but they still launched on Netflix and kind of did that pivot of okay, well now we're going to talk about launching on Netflix and. And so they, I, I guess to your point, you need this professional advice in order to guide you into pivoting the right way. Well, so that's the basic story that Lewis was talking about, right? Is the story that Rosie just mentioned wasn't necessarily about launching the new products. We turned it into a story about marketing, how everybody was adapting to marketing. So you just have to get a little more creative than normal, even though our industry is always been for us this shouldn't be too hard because we who, everything we do has to be creative and thinking outside of the box but um i do think lewis now that in that we have to look at the story and angle it a little bit differently to to that business aspect or like rosie said that marketing aspect and that's how you can kind of promote your brand through that actual angle versus just there's a new grapefruit flavored vaporizer well and I, and I think Gia raised something really interesting about podcasts, right? Um, using non-traditional media to tell a story has become even more vital. You know, I, 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 you know, I'm sporting my podcast logo and my, yes, we noticed, me. <laughs> but, but the thing here is it's not as much about this podcast as we are counseling our clients now to create their own shows. Right. Um, and it may take time to build an audience, but if you create your own vehicle that is an authentic way of communicating, whether it's audio, video, you know, or, or something, you'll find an audience and it is a way to communicate that is unfiltered by you, Deb, or by Jeremy, or by Javier. And as, as amazing as, you know, the journalists are, the value of working with journalists is that we are ultimately borrowing their brand. You know, you borrow the Business Insider brand, you borrow the brand of Green Market Report that gives you the credibility to tell your story in a, a, wor in a world, in a world that it's difficult to find time to get a journalist to pay attention to you. And you still need to tell your story if you create your own channel, your own podcast, your own video blog, whatever it is, you can do that in an authentic way and build an audience. And the key thing though, is it has to be authentic. If it is, hey, I have got this amazing new product and let me tell you about it. And it's the best flavor and it's the best whatever. People are gonna see through that and, and not watch. But if it is an authentic conversation about what it is to do what you're doing, you'll build an audience. And that's what you've done with Green Market Report. You've built an audience because it's an authentic communication about the business of cannabis. And, and that's why we're con you know, telling our clients Guys, we're going to work and we're going to we're going to work with the journalists, but it's also incumbent on you to tell your story and work around the journalists because there are so fewer of you guys out there and you're pulled so thin that we still have to tell your story. Let's just do it in a different way. And, and thank I think, you uh, Lewis, John for that JJ podcast has some, too. some Sorry. suggestions. I just wanted to thank Lewis for his podcast because my clients have enjoyed their their um their time on there. It's, it was a lot of fun. Hey, John, why don't you uh, um, run through some of the uh, suggestions that you had, you had sent to me, and I thought they were actually quite good. Uh, thanks, Deb. Um, you saw, you were talking about the um, uh, like do's and don'ts for yeah. uh, publicists that I suggested. Yeah, um, I mean, this is uh, something that I've been harping on for uh, actually several years, basically, because I've been, um, yeah, as, as every journalist on here will tell you, um, uh, handling a lot of pitches from from various PR pros and um, you know a lot, a lot of companies that uh, are very eager to get their stories told um, for a lot of the same reasons as Cynthia outlined, but. What I've found has been much more effective from uh, PR pros is in, in building relationships with journalists is more of an approach where, um, say, you know, someone like Cynthia reached out to me and said, all right, here's, um, uh, he here's what I can do for you. Here's who I represent. Here's who I can connect you with. Um, let's talk about how we can help each other as opposed to 
um, just bombarding reporters like me with the, the same kind of pitches day after day, where it's like, here, let me, let me introduce you to this specific company, which is launching a specific brand line, which, uh, you know, could make for a great story. And yeah, sure, that's, that's, you know, could be an interesting story, but there's hundreds, if not thousands of product launches, you know, every single month, every single year. And that, that, that basically is just not going to go anywhere for, um, with, with most reporters. It's, it's much more effective to build a relationship by just reaching out and saying, you know, here's who I am. Here's, here's what I can do for you. What do you need? Um, what can I help you with? And, and that way, um, there's just a lot more mutual, um, benefit because the interests tend to overlap a lot more in, in terms of that approach, as opposed to just the, you know, more traditional, here's, here's my client. Here's the story they want to tell. Can I sell you on it? Um, I, for me, for me, that almost never works. And I just, you know, I, but I've, I've worked with a lot of PR pros to take that other approach. And, and, um, uh, I think we both tend to get a lot more out of it that way. You mean, John, you don't want an interview of someone you've never heard of? <laughs> it could be, man. I mean, depending on the story they have to tell and, you know, how compelling it is. I just, you know, it, it, it it's, it's still astonishing to me that there are some PR pros out there who, and, and I, I get that there are a lot of times, you know, client driven clients that, you know, have a particular story they want to tell and everything. But um, yeah, that's, I, maybe that, and maybe that's just me. I don't know. But so I think Harry's had some do's and don'ts as well. And then Javier writes stories at least once a year on this. So we might as well let them both get a little bit in on that. I've got it go. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, now is a good time to kind of hear from some of the, the writers. Um, we've got Warren, we've got Javier, uh, we've also got Heather, you know, talking about what do people want to read right now and what are you focusing on? Because I, I think we have touched on, you know, where COVID was the story of the day for about two months. You know, if you're in the New York area, you know, we're now in, in May. We've been quarantined since early March. And so we're starting to hit month three of this. I think we are starting, I, I know I'm getting into COVID story fatigue and moving on. Um, what about you guys? What are, you know, what is your focus right now? Are you still focused on COVID cannabis stories? Or are you starting to shift out of that? What is, what are you doing? Anyone want to go take first? We need a director. <laughs> Hold on, she's she's on mute. How about now? Can I? Can I? Heather. Hey, that um. There she is. Am I still muted? There nope. you go. You we go. can hear you. I'm good now. Um. Well, I was just gonna say. I think also, you know, you have to understand when you're pitching reporters that are outside of sort of the traditional um, group who have been covering cannabis all of these years that there is an incredible knowledge gap. And so sometimes these pitches just, I mean, I can just tell you as someone who came in with knowing nothing um, and spending three years to write my book, um, you know, I still feel like I am constantly learning. And I think that's because this is a beat that touches on so many different uh, verticals. I mean, so many, you know, whether it's science or business or health. And so I think um, to John's point about building a relationship, I think that's really important because you have to remember that a lot of times reporters, particularly if they're new to the beat or if they're general assignment reporters and they're just looking for enterprise stories, they need to get up to speed. And so even sometimes offering to kind of walk them through um, what's going on or why certain things are important because somebody from the outside is not necessarily going to know, for example, that the fact that uh, the aid bill last night, uh, last week that was, um, you know, passed by the house, the fact that there were cannabis provisions in there, that that was an interesting moment. Like the average person, the average reporter who doesn't cover all this, or even who maybe doesn't even cover the Hill, that's not something that they would necessarily be following. So I think it's really important that, you know, to understand that you sort of have to start from square one. And I, reporters in general, they want to get it right. And they want to understand the, the landscape and the context. So I think that's, that's number one. You know, it's not just about getting them to write about your product, but it's also about recognizing that this is a long, if you want this to be a fruitful relationship, it's got to be something where you're, you're helping them, you're introducing them to aspects of, of these stories that they maybe never even thought about or people that they hadn't um, considered talking to. I think it's so important with such a complex 
um, landscape. Um, and then I would just say, I think helping them understand the macro view of some of these stories. I get pitches like the ones you were just talking about. I mean, sometimes the pitches that I get are so inside baseball. Like, I would never write about some of these things just because I, the, the amount of explanation that I would have to give to my audience, I mean, they would, they would like glaze over before. So I'm always looking for, you know, sort of stories that um, I think have a certain cultural relevance um, or are tied into actual news. Um, as, as we look ahead to, you know, I have my own publicity team. I'm working on promoting my book right now. We're talking about, you know, how important it's going to be to tie in any coverage we get probably to the election. Um, because I think even though everybody's going through COVID fatigue, you know, when it comes to things like get up morning television, for example, just getting on is going to be really hard just because the news cycle is such that, and remember, again, this is such a, uh, such a complicated topic. These shows, they don't have cannabis reporters. I mean, GMA does not have a cannabis beat reporter. So when you're pitching someone, you're really starting at square one. And a lot of times you're going to have to walk them through in your pitch why this is relevant to their audience. So just, I think that's an important point. You know, some, and I just, so for those of you who don't know, I'm a former ABC News correspondent. I, I reported for Good Morning America, um, you know, worked, I am a, on the alumni board at Columbia Journalism School. So I definitely come from the old school. And, you know, for those of you that are still wanting to get those placements, I think you just have to think about it that way that, you know, you really have to keep it very basic and high level for a lot of these folks because they, they just don't, they just don't know. That's smart. What about you, Warren? What are you, what are you targeting on your stories right now? Uh, yeah, let me unmute myself. You know what? I've, I've, I would wish, I wish in a perfect world, I wouldn't be asked two things. The first thing is how much should I pay you to get my article in Forbes? That's the first thing. I don't <laughs> accept money to get into Forbes. Sure. No one. People get in touch with me all the time. The second thing is CBD. I'm on record. I, I, find it very difficult to wrap my, my arms around something that I find to be really no more than snake oil. My grandfather made Geritol. I know all about snake oil and I know about the power of the FDA and the FTC and what they can do to unregulated drugs. So I don't, I try not to write about that. Although everyone wants me to write about it. I love you. Warren. I would like to write about flowers. I'd like to write about great weed from Oregon. Do you know what people want? My number one article was about a bong. It was about a higher bong. I got 150,000 hits on it. And all I did is explain my personal experience of the enjoyment of this. People are looking for that. They want to take their mind away from TV news. I'm living a three week away from news right now. I have never felt better. Yeah. <laughs> my body is not reactive, it's supportive. I want to see people. Yeah, but you're not a better. PR pro. Uh, but I don't to have to be, Lewis, I don't have to be a PR pro. I have to write five <laughs> articles a month for, uh, for Forbes, but I write 30 I get because it. I want to make, make a difference in the world. I want to write about stories that resonate. And I, I really want to do well by others. Get away from news. I, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, hey, I, I hear you, Warren. Um, it's the same thing. I, I wrote for Forbes for a little <laughs> while and I used to get that all the time, like people wanting to, to pay me to, to get a yeah, place that I, I never know. quite get, uh, understood I that. Know. You know, Javier, you know, with Benzinga, you're also on the business side. Um, are you, you know, we're in the thick of earnings season. So, you know, uh -huh. it's, you know, I know I've had to, you know, shift away from COVID and I'm on the earnings beat. And honestly, the earnings haven't been horrible they've actually been pretty decent what are you are you pivoting over to the earnings now or are you still COVID camp I mean I, I gotta be honest you know answering the, the initial question you know that opened this debate what do people want people do still want a lot of COVID-19 coverage I posted one article on cannabis and COVID yesterday I got 8,000 clicks on Benzinga alone and that is, you know, without counting syndication and Yahoo, et cetera, which I'm sure gets a lot more. Now, you know, what people want is important, but to me, it's honestly, I've never been particularly interested in cannabis and COVID. We've done two, three stories a day and it's enough, right? But if everyone all like 
everyone is pitching only cannabis and COVID, I'm, you know, I'm not particularly interested. As you say, the world continues. You should stay at home, just to be clear. The fact that we want the world to move on does not mean we should not be respecting social distancing rules, but the world does go on. So, you know, I'm, I'm still seeing people interested in Aurora earnings or YCBD earnings this week, or, you know, Tilray's earnings last week, as you mentioned. So honestly, uh, unless you have a fresh angle on COVID, maybe just stop it. I've, I've heard a hundred pitches of companies pivoting to, to make hand sanitizer as if I cared. You know, I cared about the first two. It was like, wow, that is crazy. Same yes. for charitable initiatives. I get pictures like we donated a hundred and like a thousand dollars. It's like, good for you. Donate another thousand. Don't spend it on another press release. I'm sorry, PR people. I shouldn't be saying this, but you know. <laughs> it's the right thing to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in news. I mean, especially in cannabis, there's not a lot more to cannabis in COVID. We are essential, we know that. Sales have spiked, we know that. We, we, are, we were not included in the original you know, federal stimulus package, not a surprise. You know, the federal government still consider, considers cannabis an illegal substance. And now to a certain extent, we're, we're included. That's interesting, but again, like commentary arrives five days late, you know, until we go to a vote, I don't wanna hear your opinions on you know, the, the, <laughs> the stimulus package from five days ago, I've already written about it, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm all about the regular news cycle. We've hired like 10 people since, since COVID uh, oh, started at Benzinga. Take a moment um, and jump in that Javier has launched a Spanish cannabis news site in the middle of COVID-19. Can you just give us a quick Rundown as to why you chose to do it at the time. Did you see an uptick in people looking to consume? Oh, content? no. So you it, took it was a coincidence. I honestly, it was ready to launch, elplanteo.com. Um, and, and everyone here actually is in some way contributing to it. So thank you for the support. I love you. <laughs> and um, honestly, it just coincided. I'm, I'm, I feel guilty. I feel a little bit guilty thriving in a context where the world is falling to pieces. Um, I'm not press releasing on, on the accomplishments. I do understand that operating companies need to, uh, but it was honestly a coincidence. It was to a certain extent, a lucky coincidence. I feel it's almost like this concept of, of schadenfreude where you feel a little bit happy for other people's you know, misfortunes. It's not that, but the fa you know the fact that everyone is at home certainly made it easier for me to launch a digital media outlet and 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 get traffic right away and get attention right away just because people are sitting at home and googling stuff. <laughs> so that's, so that's that bring, I mean, thank you, Javier, and and also I just wanted to to quickly mention before we go to our next uh, uh, panelist that Heather's book is called The New Chardonnay. I know she mentioned her book, but she didn't say the title, so it's uh, certainly a difficult thing, as Warren knows, to write a book um, as he's written several, and uh, <laughs> so quite a few, and uh, so that's a, a big accomplishment. So you should be proud of yourself. Um, and, and Jeremy, you know, we, you know, it was mentioned earlier that you were on the COVID beat for a while and you just uh, moved back um, on your desk over to cannabis. And John, you're with High Times. You know, you guys have had a lot going on there. Uh, can you two kind of talk about um, how you're making these decisions on what you're covering? You know, because Jeremy, you, you're on the business side. And I know you get overwhelmed with the pitches and such. And, and John, you know, for High Times, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily business. It's more cultural and lifestyle. So I'm curious to hear from you guys what your focus is right now and how you're making these editorial decisions. Um, sure. Yeah, no, thanks for, uh, Deborah. thanks for tagging me in there. Um, I mean, for those of you that don't know me, I write, uh, I write about cannabis for Business Insider. I was doing... COVID coverage uh, in New York for the past two months. Um, happy to be back. A lot less, uh, a lot less death and destruction on this beat, of course. So, 
a little bit more fun. Um, but a- anyway, so I'll kind of I kind of want to ping back off of a point uh, that that John made. Um, you know, for for us at least, we're we're a pretty mainstream financial publication. Like we're not an industry publication, so the bar is is really high to go from a pitch to a story. Um, specifically, being you know, I write for a subscription vertical, so. Um, the value proposition to readers is information that you cannot get elsewhere, right? So uh, when something comes to me as a pitch or something as a press release that already sort of denigrates the value of, of what I'm supposed to do. Um, now, all that isn't to say like I'm focused on negative news, but uh, generally speaking, you know, news is something that others don't want reported. Some people do. Um, and so that's where, that's where my focus lies. Um, whether that is layoffs, uh, which the industry, you know, has gone through a lot, um, whether that's protecting employers uh, against false promises from entrepreneurs, uh, whether it's bringing some rigor to what retail investors are looking at when they decide to make investments. Um, that's where we position ourselves and that's, that's what I'm primarily interested in. Um, that being said, you know, when people like it, there, there is positive news as well, you know, when, uh, you know, mainstream, uh, you know, pension funds or big private equity funds, hedge funds invest in cannabis companies, that's good for the industry and that's good news when, you know, cannabis startups raise really big rounds. Um, we report on that. Like, obviously that gets press released and that's something that, you know, we can find an angle on that, that works for our readers and, and uh, you know, you know, bring subscriptions through the door for lack of a better term. Um, yeah, I kind of lost my train of thought there, but anyways, I, I, that's, that's, that's sort of what we're looking at. Um, you know, on the flip side, if, if a company is sort of touting that they raised a round, then it's a major down round. Um, using the press release can actually kind of hurt the company because we can easily show like, look, they're touting raising $35 million uh, when their series B was $70 million, something like that. So um, we, you know, we, we're very careful on that and we're very attuned to that. Um, you know, that being said, uh, again, to one of John's points is that you all, you know, you the PR people that I work with on a regular basis, I very much respect and I listen to, and you guys have eyes and ears on things that I generally do not see. Um, you're all pretty deeply sourced. So that is very helpful to me. Um, when you're like, oh, you should take a look at this company. I take that seriously uh, because I, I believe those are good companies and I think you're bringing it to me in good faith. Um, the flip side of that is like, you know, if there's too much of that, it gets a little bit tuned out. It's like, these all cannot be good companies because of what I see in the industry, right? Um, so I'll, I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that. Hold on, Jeremy, before we move on, I think as PR people from the other side, some of our clients don't understand a lot of times that if they raise $3 million, that's not business insider news, yeah. not fortune news. Do you guys have any sort of, and I think John Scheuer, you also at, uh, MJ Biz Daily have some sort of criteria, um, in place that, you know, if, there's a certain amount raised or if there's certain technology involved, what are your, can you each give us a little bit of um, insight as to what's appropriate for brands and companies and even PR people to pitch um, these days for those types of stories? Jeremy? Uh, yeah, sure. sure. I, I can, I can just dive in on that. Um, you know, the, the real, I, I guess, Bottom line, the round has to be large uh, for it to be a standalone story. It has to be large um, and selfishly, we'd like it to be an exclusive to us. Um, again, because, you know, I, you know, just being totally frank about that, like we're a subscription publication. Uh, I got to, I got to bring subscriptions through the door um, and exclusives do that. Um, the round has to be large or if there's an interesting wrinkle, uh, you know, like I said before, institutional investors investing in a plant touching company somehow, if we can explain the financial mechanism or the legal mechanism they're using to do that, uh, you know, that's an interesting story to us. Um, all that being said, like if a client, you know, raises one and a half million dollars and they really, or whatever it may be, $2 million and they really want to be in Business Insider, um, there are smart ways to do that, but that's not a standalone story. It might be, here, here's the challenges with doing a small fundraise uh, for a cannabis startup, or here's why this sort of niche part of the cannabis industry is raising money and look at this example. Um, but it, it generally uh it may be too small to be a standalone um you someone know. is asking what's large right like what what's our criteria for large and and uh and there lewis says 10 million or more what what do you yes. think uh that's i mean we uh, lewis is right um we i don't have like a hard and fast rule around that um 
but we like to Wait, see a can you say that again around. i so rarely hear that in my life. <laughs> yeah that's right uh lewis was right um i you know it's not a hard and fast rule uh evaluations in excess of 100 million um if they're disclosing valuation the raise in excess of 10 million is kind of a good rule like we're going to take a closer look at that um that being said it can be a little smaller if there's big name investors mainstream investors uh, John, Sorry, Schler, man, Jeremy, Bizdale, you guys have a little bit of a criteria for that too, as well. No? Yeah, we do. Um, we, I mean, uh, a few years ago when capital raises were uh, much less common, um, it was, I mean, we would write about just in, in nearly any capital raise that was announced by any company because it was still fairly rare, you know, three, four or five years ago. Um, but I think it was about two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, we started a rule. I'd have to go back and check, but I think our rule of thumb is that a capital raise has to be minimum, maybe 10 or 20 million for us to even do a news bit on from, from a press release, because there's so many capital raises in you know, just the seven figures or under that we just don't have the bandwidth now. Um, and that really became a, uh, that, that really became a hurdle in, I think it was 2018, uh, when, when capital raises really started ramping up. Um, but, and related to just your other question about, you know, uh, a, um, what could make a single story pitch stand out? I, I, I agree with Jeremy there. There's going to be, have to be something pretty extraordinary about a single press release to get the attention of a reporter or an editor that would lead to a standalone story either. I mean, you know, either it has to be something like the biggest acquisition in, you know, cannabis industry history, um, or it, it would have to be something pretty monumental um, to, to really get that sort of attention right away without, without fitting into a bigger picture or a bigger story trend or, or something. Um, Otherwise, it's just we, we don't we don't let PR folks run run the news business. Sorry to say, everybody, but we have to we have to we have to be discerning in some level. Um, and so we just uh, that's that's just part of a. Uh, in addition to the, I think the financial raises, there's some other tips I think that brands and companies should know. These days, unless you've hired um, you know Zuckerberg or someone, your your new hire releases probably are not going to garner that much press. Um, in addition, you know we don't want to hear about a board member. I'm not sure. Again, unless it's you know Obama, Barack Obama or something, that's not really news. So I think it's important for brands to really understand that before they start asking a their PR people to work miracles that are just not going to happen. Um, you got to really understand and, and manage expectations. And for brands and, and um, companies, when their representatives go out there, it's so that they're not discouraged when those stories aren't picked up. Everybody, look, I have a brand, and to me, it's the most amazing thing on earth. But to everybody else, it's, you know, it's not. It's fabulous, but it's just you got to keep that in perspective when you're pitching so that you really understand why your stories aren't being picked up. And I think, too, it's the dollars and cents thing. And, and John uh, from High Times, you might want to speak to this because, you know, it's I know you guys work with a lot of contributors at this point. Um, you're making decisions on, am I going to spend this money on a contributor for this story? So what what is helping you push that story over that dollar line? So it's, it's interesting because having worked on both sides of this, I was in the, on the PR side for a long time. And I think that's how I know a lot of you guys, actually. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what we're looking to do now, um, definitely given the climate that we're in, is, is looking for a positive lift. I mean, since I've kind of come into the role at High Times, one of the things that we've tried to do is shine a positive light on the industry um, and not focus on, you know, some of the things that... Uh, I wouldn't even call them competitors, but some of the other publications in the space like to make waves off of. We don't really like, you know, push for the, uh, for, for drama stories. So this hasn't really changed that much for us in terms of COVID, but now more than ever, finding things that like leave a positive impression on the reader is something that we're really serious about. And not just in the sense of like, hey, is this going to make this person feel good? But like, no, this is something that 
I don't want it to seem like we were going to hold this story or anything like that. But like when you're seeing this, like the tests and reports come out of Israel of how like cannabis can potentially help fight the coronavirus or something like that. We hesitate telling that story now, uh, not necessarily because we don't want to celebrate like, you know, that there's something good is happening for our plant. But like, I also don't want people out in the street who are just smoking without masks on thinking like, oh, High Times told me it's OK that if I'm smoking weed that like I won't get coronavirus or something like that, you know. So it's definitely we're definitely walking a line. Um, but there's, I mean, listen, in, there's tons of ways to utilize your network and what you're already doing in order to help promote things. So like, for example, uh, one thing that we've been focusing on the last couple of months is getting a lot of our bigger pieces translated into Spanish to kind of help, you know, some other audiences who want to read it. Um, there's some hard costs to that, that like, you know, just weren't working out for us. And so Javi happened to be launching his own site at this time and, and going on all these efforts. So if there's a way that like we can work together and I can help get more eyeballs to his content while also helping satisfy my audience with, you know, something that like we can't provide, like I don't speak Spanish, you know what I mean? I'm not comfortable editing a piece in Spanish, so I wouldn't put it up, but like, I trust Javi. I know how great his work is like having access to that kind of content and like being able to help push his, his message forward, I think is a win for all of us. Um, the other thing is like just creating content ourselves. Like everyone on this call has, you know, a very unique lens into this industry and a perspective that like, you know, not a lot of people get. So to the point, I don't remember who made it earlier, but like we have been a lot more receptive to like guest posts and things like that from like leading executives in the space. Now, I'm not like saying, hey, come on and wax about your brand or tell me, you know, all the reasons why people should work with you. But if you're going to come in and like teach my audience something that like they could help that they could benefit from without necessarily doing it to make money off of them, like that's something we're very interested in. Um, there's also like I know everyone has said this, especially on the editorial side, but th there's so many pitches right now uh, going out around like, you know, pivoting to making hand sanitizer or donating masks or something like that. And like, there is, I, I feel like lately we've been relying less on pitches because we're getting so much from of that noise. And like, listen, I totally get it. Like when your baby does something, you're very proud of it. You want to get as much mileage as you can out of that movement. But like, some of this is the right thing to do. We're in a crisis right now. You know what I mean? Like these people, like yeah. healthcare workers need masks. They need like, you know, protective gear. Like donating that is, it's not a, a, a press release. You know, it's not a publicity stunt. It's like your company trying to help what we're all collectively facing right now. And it reminds me of like, I mean, this is still happening this year, but do you remember a couple of years ago when like there would be like ads that were banned from TV for like the Super Bowl or whatever, because like they were going and intending to, <laughs> they were intending to <laughs> run something during the Super Bowl. I did that. Bowl. That was me. There you go. So like that, like, listen, the first time that that, that, you, that that happened, like, of course, there was a news story about it. But then after it happened, like you saw, like there were six to 10 people that followed on, like knowing they were never going to get their ad on TV, but like they thought, hey, I can get an earned media wave out of that we don't necessarily like that it costs us money to write stories i can't just afford to you know spend budget on telling some fun gimmick that you guys did do you know what i mean yeah. i totally get that i had to explain that to someone the other day when uh you know they pitched me something and i just i just flat out said look i can't spend money on a story that is not going to move the needle in any way and, and i think you know bringing up advertising is a great segue to terry stanley who's with Ad Week, and last but not least, Terry, um, you know, certainly um, our industry is very challenged on the advertising side. A lot of us can't boost our stories on Facebook because of cannabis, um, but yet we're happy to take cannabis advertising for, um, you know, outlets like Green Market Report. Um, tell us what, what you're seeing from your end right now. Um, okay, I'm going to be the, uh, I'll be the cranky reporter here because <laughs> I'm OG and I'm very cranky. So, um, I dare you to be my, my fellow panelists have discussed this already. Um, I'll just tell you, we, we at Adweek do not have a cannabis beat. I just have to happen to sort of be the de, de facto cannabis reporter because I have an interest in it. I'm based in LA, so it makes perfect sense for me to cover this area. But 
I cover it in a very ad week way. And that's why this incredible wave of pitches that I get are majority hit the delete button because they don't understand ad week. They don't follow ad week. They don't follow me. They don't know what I like. They don't know what I cover. They don't understand the nuances of this publication because maybe people think that ad week is strictly covering the advertising industry and the ad agency business way back in the day it did, but it is much broader now. It's very much a publication that, say anybody who is interested in any consumer category would be interested in reading. You, you could go to our homepage any single day and find all kinds of very consumery, but with a business and an advertising and marketing underpinning. Um, so I get these pitches, this may be relevant to the audience listening, that are very much this one size fits all. So it's a cut and paste with my name on it maybe, sometimes not even that. So I'll get a cut and paste pitch. As soon as I open it, I already know, hey, would you like to cover X, Y, and Z? No, delete. Um, because I can tell that that was CC the world. Yeah. And that really annoys me because I'm a cranky reporter, right? I would love to, to add a little note here from, you know, it's, it's an interesting conclusion I've come to while listening to this panel. Uh, I arrived at this panel thinking, well, my criteria for what I like and what pisses me off must be the same for every journalist. <laughs> and interestingly enough, it is not. Like John said, you know, uh, I, I like when people reach out and, and, and ask what they can help with. To me, that's like, it pisses me off. It's like, you know, I won't tell you what I'm working on, but it seems Heather said, walk us through the you know, through the industry and, and, and introduce us to it. Again, pot pee for me. It's like, really? I know cannabis. John, for instance, one, one time he said, uh, I like it when people email me on an informal tone, like, hey man, what's up? This product is dope. Check it out. If someone emailed me like that, I would be like appalled. Like, dude, I'm a business reporter. I'm not your friend. Like, dude, is a thing for this panel, not for it. Hey, do it in, in an email when, when you don't know me. Then, and, and, and you know, all this kind of ties up, you know, to Teal's point, know us. If evidently, the, the common, you know, thread here is know who you're pitching. If, if you're going to pitch me, pitch Javier, and it's one style, Jeremy has a different style. No, you know, know that the, for instance, size of a race, you need to pitch Jeremy for Business Insider, something that is Business Insider worthy or Forbes worthy, you know, just know what you're doing. Um, but it was interesting to, to see how each one of us had very different preferences, often opposed. <laughs> well, and and to, to your point, Javier, um, it may be a little harder for the PR staff to go about it that way, but that targeted approach is probably going to be way more successful than the fast and easy uh, CC, as Terry mentioned. So yeah, you're doing this That's broad lazy, email Dad. and you can tell your boss, I, I pitched 40 reporters this morning. I don't know why no one's responding. Whereas it might take a little bit longer to pitch five reporters, but then you may get three hits out of that five. So Look, we, we don't get, we don't get paid to check boxes, right? right? You know, our clients don't care about the process of pitching and placing a story. They care about the results. And when I hear that my team members are sending out mass emails, it drives me nuts. I took the time to develop relationships with every one of you on this call, every single one of you, right? When I pitch you, I know what I am pitching and who I am pitching and why it is right for Business Insider or High Times or Forbes. I don't waste your time. And when I find out that my team members are doing that, they have wasted my time because I am paying them money to do what I do, which is learn who the media is, learn what the outlet covers, learn how to be effective at pitching. And if they come back to me and say, Oh, I pitched 40 reporters today. I'm like, bullshit. 
you didn't actually pitch 40 reporters. You may have sent 40 emails out, but did you actually do the research and know what their last four stories were? Did you reference one or two of those stories in a pitch to show the journalists that you have the respect for the time that they put into writing so that they will pay attention to your pitch? That's did you actually get on the phone and call them and say, hey, I want to talk to you about something. Not, I just sent you an email. Did you read it? Because if that's what my team members are doing, then I am wasting money on them and my clients are wasting money with me and it pisses me off. So when you say what you guys are saying, I really hope, and I have asked Javier this and I've asked Jeremy this, that when you get mass emails from my team members, send them to me and I'm going to talk to them about how to pitch properly because that's not how you do what we do. It's not what Cynthia does. It's not what Rosie does. It's not what Gia does. And it's not what I do. So there is, you know, I feel like a bobblehead from that. I mean, I think that Lewis, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I think Lewis just basically captured the difference between PR pros and people who are either not necessarily no vice, but really are dipping their toe into, let's say, quote unquote, the cannabis space because that should that that's an all-time like public relations do like you know what to do and what not to do no matter the industry you cover and so when i hear that people are just hitting um media or journalists up randomly to say hey do you want to cover this they obviously haven't done their homework which is like that's the first rule of thumb you have to do your research and know who you're pitching to I've known John Troyer for as long as I've been in this industry. And one thing is I'm not going to call John about some BS because I know what John covers, right? And my personal uh, pet peeve is I hate my time being wasted. So I don't want to waste my time nor anyone else's time. So if any of us are reaching out to you who've been in this space and who know what to do, it's because we believe this is an interest of yours that you would like to cover because it's either you know your interest and, and your readership ones or they're learning something new either way i mean i think lewis just captured what we all feel not only from our side but also the media side like it's stupid when i hear that people are just saying hey dude cover like you know this new flavor I, by the way i am though really curious about that cbd pillow because i'm curious to see if my night's sleep is going to be any better i meant to say something about that I I, I all looked into that right am i the only one who spent like a half hour trying to figure out what was the cbd part of that pillow <laughs> I, I i definitely did that um i just want to pose one more question and then we'll wrap it well, up here uh, um, let me jump in one second for the brands that are on the call and they're not for pr pros there is a way to take the same core information and that can go in that email so everything that you need to send as far as literally the nuts and bolts can remain the same but what I would do as a new brand uh, or a new person who's trying to pitch out to the media, in the first paragraph or in the first few lines, that's where you target the specific journalist and their beat. That's all they're gonna look at. If you can in there say, I saw your article last week on this, I noticed you write on this, blah, 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 blah. Then the rest of it can remain pretty um, you know, template or cookie cut or whatever the case may be. You don't have to re invent the wheel each email. You just have to specify and target the individual writers and journalists in those first few lines. That's, I think, the tip to take away from everything we just heard right now. So the, the one thing I want to close on and, um, and put it out to the panelists is, you know, events. Uh, I love seeing everybody here. I love seeing your faces. I miss you guys. Um, we're, we're colleagues, we're competitors. Uh, but, you know, we, we play in a very small sandbox and I have the utmost respect, you know, for my fellow journalists. Um, you know, we, like I said, we, we work together and, you know, there's just uh, no animosity with each other. And I think that that's great. Um, but I miss you guys. We don't do events now. And what is your thought about events? All right, I know I'm getting stuff on my calendar for October and September. I'm just curious to put that out there. What are you seeing? What are you feeling? Are you not going to do anything till 2021? Are you going to go back to them in September, October? 
I want to go ahead and say I am not responding positively to pitches about in real life events uh, right now. Even if you're rescheduling for the fall or something like that, I think it's totally tone deaf. And like, I do not want to be a part of it. In fact, it's probably going to ruin the relationship between us. I've definitely sent some emails that like, I wish I didn't, but uh, you know, pushed people down the lens of like, you really think this is going to happen. They responded the wrong way. And that was it. I think it's important to understand that I think for us, we're preparing to accept the fact that events may not happen again until sometime in 2021, unless something as far as treatment comes up or even vaccine, I don't know, whatever the case may be. I think we're all going to sit tight until at least, you know, things really become clear that, that it's safe. I certainly don't want to throw an event and have a bunch of people get sick. I mean, that would destroy my name, destroy every company I'm part of, destroy anything I'm part of. It's just, it's not worth it. I would just ease back on the events right now. And it, is, it does get a little frustrating when you have these people constantly stalking you for money for sponsorships when we know there's gonna be no event. So it's just, let's ease back a little bit, become realistic. Without the events, I do wanna mention for the brands and the, and the people, the attendees that are watching, your options for, for exposure right now without events um, you've got earned media, and that's what a lot of this was for, was to help you understand better um, practices so that you have a shot to get in front of these journalists and possibly have your story picked up. Um, you know, so you've got earned media, email marketing, social media, influencers, um, and things like giveaways and collaborations with other brands that you can tie into social media. I think these are the areas that um, people need to focus on for exposure and just step away from the events for now. That's my... Can I, can I just say something to that? Um, and and I, I think that was John, what, from High Times that just um, said that he pushes away from that. So it's interesting. I wasn't going to mention that I was affiliated with Women Grow on this because I was wearing my GVM hat. But here's what I found interesting in the last couple of weeks uh, as I was speaking to two other... Uh, program or events uh, producers. So one of the things that I found interesting is I said, well, why are you still pitching um, for live, you know, in-person panel events as though we're going to go back to what we were doing before? And I said, I actually find that a little bit offensive because coming from Women Grow, that's what we do. We do live and in-person events. I had to make a conscious decision to say to everyone, hey, listen, we're not doing live events until 2021. But the difference between what we do and what some of the other events producers do is they're under contracts. And so they actually have to continue to operate as though some of these things are still happening based on the city or states that they're having their event. Because if they're not acting as though they're not, right, they can't break their contracts with whomever they have contracts with um, existing. So I had to take a step back from that and say, I get it. I understand. You still have to operate as if this thing is going to happen in October, November, what have you. And you have to continue doing your job, which is getting the sponsors and getting the speakers. And then what I've noticed, um, John Troy is with MJ Biz, right? And so having realized that MJ Biz shifted to their virtual event, which would have been in New Orleans in person, but it went to a virtual conference, you know, I, I believe that's what we're going to end up seeing a lot more, um, especially coming in the fall. But I had to actually learn that same lesson, John, where I was like, I made the decision to cancel all of my live events for Women Grow. And why aren't these other people doing it? But I realized that their commitments are somewhat different from what the others. And so until a city or state calls it and says all events, all live events are canceled, they actually still have to operate as though they're promoting because the cities are expecting this promotion for these events. Oh. I totally hear you. And I just, just to respond to that really quickly, um, I, I have been an event promoter myself besides the stuff, the cannabis cup stuff that we do with high times. Like my, I came up producing events in New York city. Um, I totally recognize that. Uh, but there's two reasons why I still, even if I was in contracts would want to make sure that I was outwardly saying, Hey, I'm trying to protect people. I care about your health and B it's also because of like people like, like the situation you're in, you know, how many people on your team you can't afford to pay right now who are not making the money they're used to making 
making. The amount of seasonal workers that I have who come and only work the summer, who work on high times events, and then you know are used to having taking the fall off and then making their nut again. Those people are not in positions that uh, they even know where their next check is coming from. And right. I, well, again, I totally understand. You know, not wanting to uh, uh, basically. Uh, the balk on contracts or anything like that, I do think it's important that you take this step. And one thing that I have been responsive to are, are the event promoters that are trying to figure out what the next option is instead of just saying, hey, we're still going to assemble even though we don't know what's necessarily healthy. But hey, like, here's a perfect example. The biggest concert of all time just happened on Fortnite. Okay. It was, didn't happen in, you know, it wasn't Live Aid. It wasn't anything like that. It happened in a video game. That's I'm amazed by that. I think that's one of the coolest things that's ever happened. Like that's where I, what I'm interested in. That the guy who set that up, I'd love I'd love to chat with him about what's next. Totally agree. Totally agree. Well, that's been that that was uh, pretty interesting. I you know, like I said, I'm still booked for some stuff in the fall. I you know, I don't know. I you know, and and I would love to return back to events, you know, events, you know, like I'm sure John would uh, agree uh, both Johns is you know it's a big part of our budgets and losing that is pretty painful um but yeah if the cities and states reopen you don't have an argument to say no to contracts but um listen i don't want to keep anybody any longer we we got started a little late um i want to thank everybody once again for taking the time out i know uh, as we've all said everyone's super busy because we're all strapped for time uh, with with fewer people doing more. Uh, thank you for all our attendees. We appreciate you uh, dialing in. Thank you, Cynthia, for helping to set this up. And uh, we will have this recorded and we'll post it uh, later on our YouTube channel. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful everyone. day. Bye. Bye, everyone.